Well, hello, Mr. Connolly. How are you, Nicola? All right. I'm great. How are you, keeping? I'm doing good. Christopher, it's just so good to meet you. Thanks so much, Nicola. Likewise. Honestly, honestly, I'm just totally blown away by your videos and the the engagement that you have on social media is just completely blowing me away at the minute. Deadly, Nicola. I, and I appreciate all your support as well. Not at all. Not at all. Before we go any further, right, what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to read out your bio. Yeah. So, it is my pleasure to introduce Christopher Connolly. He shares his story of strength and hope through addiction, as well as other avenues of life. And he tries to encourage people to exercise more and work on themselves daily to get better. Now, that is two sentences, Christopher, but it's very, very loaded. <laughs> it's very, very loaded. That's like a lifetime of stuff in two sentences. Does that really encompass exactly who you are? Yeah, well, that's what I, I just want to, to be. You know what I mean? I want to be better and I want to, I want to try to show people that they can be better. And it doesn't have to be like in a, a grandiose sense of way. It can just be better in little daily habits. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, not giving out when you have to bring the kids to school. You know what I mean? Little yeah. things like this. Yeah, okay. So I'm really, I'm big into language, Christopher, right? And I'm really glad that you always say, that you help people be better rather than feel better, right? Yeah. So let's get into the feeling better. 100%. You have an amazing backstory, which I only know part of because of social media, because you and I have never spoken personally before. So do you want to bring us back to the furthest point that you're comfortable with of how you ended up being in the position that you're in right now? Yeah, so for as long as I can remember, I never used to know how to express myself from a very, very young age. Um, I used to get bullied a lot between um, having scars on my face and being in school. It very sort of normal thing of growing up. But I can remember for a long, long time, I just didn't know how to express myself, how to cope with my feelings and how to understand who I was. Yeah. Um, for a long time growing up, I really struggled with this. I yeah. had an anxiety. I was always fearful, everything else. And yeah. lo and behold, as I started to grow up, I started to come in contact with alcohol and the use of drugs. Yeah, so um, it's really important at this point, Christopher, for everybody who is under a rock and doesn't know who you are, that you are in recovery. Yeah, I'm in recovery. I'm nearly coming up to two years in recovery now, sober from all narcotics, alcohol, um, completely sober, thank God. Congratulations, um, Christopher. I'm delighted for you. Thanks, Nicola. I really am. I do look at you and I have so much pride in my heart looking at you. Thanks so much. I appreciate because, that. Look, and I mean that genuinely because I've been surrounded by addiction my whole life. And unfortunately, I don't know too many success stories like yours. Yeah. And it, it, it's, it's very, very common. Unfortunately, a lot of people pay the ultimate sacrifice, which yeah. is death. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. for a long time, I used to think that um, that death was the worst thing that could happen to you. Yeah. Um, but it's it's also losing your mental health. And it's yeah. also living a life of yeah. mass destruction in your own mind. Absolutely. There's never more powerful sentence said today than that. Okay. So we're going back to when you were a kid. You're struggling. You're being bullied. People are pointing out marks on your face. You couldn't communicate properly in, in, your, um, in your world. And you got older and you met with drink. Yeah, and then as soon what as age I started, you for? Um, so I would have started off um, with steroids before I started off, believe it or not, with alcohol. But Isn't that food, extraordinary? Yeah, yeah. How, tell us how you came in contact with steroids and what age were you? I think I was about 17 years of age. See, okay. I quickly realised that I couldn't... For years, I was obsessed with wanting to be noticed for anything else other than my skin, other oh. than my complexion, you know? And I can remember I, I was always feeling less down. I never wanted to go into school, everything else. But what was the issue with your skin, Christopher? I used to have severe acne, and I have scars now. Or yeah. I'm all right with it now, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, but I used to have severe acne all over my face. I used okay. to have, like, lumps, bumps, where you can't even squeeze them. It was, it was very, very hard growing up. But yeah. when I got into the gym, 
I started to uh, get introduced to a lot of people who would be taking anabolic steroids. Yes. And lo and behold, I left her off for a while, left her off for a while, left her off for a while. And then it just got to the stage where everybody else was doing it. Like everybody says, so I started doing it myself. It was normalised. Exactly. Yeah. Normalised in that environment. Yeah. Um, and like the, the whole thing of sticking a syringe into your bum yeah. seems so normal. But looking back now at 17 <laughs> years of age, it's absolutely <laughs> crazy. So Bonkers. Then, bonkers. Um, but uh, uh, lo and behold, I started off doing that. And like it was weekly upon weekly improvements in my physique. And then I got so much attention for my physique, for my muscles. My and goodness. everything just started to disappear about my face. I started to forget I had acne. started to forget I had acne scars. And then I was just, com I was completely obsessed with how I looked in yes. terms of my image, my yes. exterior. Yes, yes, yes. So it's really important at this point, because of the work that I do, when I hear people saying things, that triggers something about my work, I want to point it out to the listener, okay? Yeah. So what Christopher is saying is, instead of him going inside and doing the internal work and healing himself on how he was feeling about himself, <coughs> in, what he was doing was, is working on himself externally. So this is what I would call titanium plate, Christopher. So I believe we're all born with a titanium plate in our chests. Yeah. And through life experiences, our titanium plate becomes damaged. And nobody pulls us aside and teaches us how to fill the holes of our titanium plate correctly. So what we do is, is we fill our titanium plate from the outside in. Yeah. With yeah. steroids, with drink, with drugs, with women, with porn, with gambling, with affairs, with whatever. Yeah. And that you can do to numb the feeling. Yeah. Sign me up now quick. That's, that's it, Nicola. I'm getting in the queue twice for this. <laughs> right so you're there you're in the gym you're 17 you have forgotten your acne you're getting loads of attention which is ego from external sources and you're like yeah no problem i'd stick that yeah so, Jimmy Ars, no yeah sign me yeah. up do the other one that's it that's it um and lo and behold like just the i can remember like the the instant gratification that i got from it was just above anything I've ever felt in my life. It was right. the biggest release of sort of mixed emotions between a happiness and then a, a sadness and everything else. But it was a perfect roller coaster because mm -hmm. when I was when I was off that sad buzz back to being happy again, it was it was crazy. But um, this went on for a long period of time, mm -hmm. and then a friend of mine started going out. And I started going to nightclubs with him. Lo and behold, I had to... What nightclubs were you going to, Christopher? Uh, I used to go to Sin Nightclub okay. in Dublin. And, Jesus, I used to go to a, a very bad nightclub called Play. Okay. Uh, it used to be where you go to grab a granny, Nicola. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. You see, I'm a couple of years older than you, so my club and Sin would have been different clubs. Yeah, yeah. So I was in the Olympic, I was <laughs> in asylum, I was in science, I was in all them places, but we we, we missed each other because there's an age gap. So you're sure. going clubbing, you go clubbing. Yeah, so as soon as I went to clubbing, started the whole tight t-shirt wearing thing, do the old hair, and then lo and behold, it was the first time in my life where I was really sort of genuinely had some interest from women, from oh. females, oh. and... This was the second addiction. Then I just went down the whole avenue of wanting to get girls, wanting to get girls, wanting to get girls, because it was just filling a void within yes. me that yes. I never really realized that I had. Yes. I, was, I was missing that, and it's a lot from the upbringing as well. I was missing that female mother figure from a young age. Okay. You know? can, you, can you talk to us about that, Christopher? Yeah, so from a young age, I, 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 me and my mother were always at loggerheads, okay. always fighting back and forth. And I somehow developed a fantastic relationship with my grandmother. And It's your mom's mom? My mom's mom, yeah. Okay. 
And we Why had... Why great, Christopher? Ah, uh, Nicola. No, a... Nobody like my granny. Nobody like my granny either. <laughs> <laughs> we can have a granny off. <laughs> <laughs> that probably explains why I was going out to grab grannies. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. Light bulb moment right there. <laughs> well, um, me grandmother and I had a fantastic relationship and I, I really cherish it till this day. But unfortunately, she got very, very sick. And when she passed away, I was just lost. I was well what age that happened, Christopher? I was 16, and which, oh, which, which explains why 17 I started to experiment with the uh, steroids and going out and everything. I was yeah. searching for something, do you know what I mean? There yeah, was but a your, mommy was, your mommy was in your life. You were living with your mommy. Living with me, mommy, yeah. Because we're at loggerheads all the time. All the time, yeah. And was your dad at home? My dad was at home as well, yeah. And what was your relationship like with him? Um, we used to have like a, a platonic relationship, you know what I mean? Just hello, good boy. Um, yeah, my dad had his struggles as well. Um, growing up with um with alcoholism, he doesn't drink now either. Fair play to him. Yeah, yeah, okay. he had a liver transplant, but yeah, like we we had a good we have a good relationship, you know. It's not a fantastic relationship, yeah. but it's it is it is good, you know. Okay, okay. So you're at loggerheads with your mom, your nanny passes, it's a perfect storm. You have disco muscles. You're in the discos now. You're getting attention from the women and the grannies. And the grannies, yeah. And you're, you're living your best life as far as you're concerned at the time. Yeah, and then this went on for a long time. Still hadn't picked up any uh, drugs yet. Was barely a drinker, barely a drinker. Um, and then lo and behold... Um, I got introduced to, uh, I went on a holiday to Ibiza right. and when we got in, when we got over to Ibiza, um, a couple of the lads were taking ecstasy mm. and when we were over there, I can remember, I said to myself, Do you know what, I'm just going to try and see what it's like mm -hmm. and it, I swear to God, it was instantaneous and he fears any anxiety, mm. any worry about me, nanny I had, yes. it all just disappeared. And I can remember thinking to myself, this is my life now. Yeah. This is this is all I've ever wanted. To yeah. have no fear, to have no hurt, no pain, no responsibilities. And I can remember I was so naive when it happened. Some fella said oh, in the, the disco, you're going to need to take another one of them in a while or else you'll come down. And I says, what do you mean come down? Am I not like this forever? I'll never... Oh, oh, Christopher. I know, I know. I swear to God. Oh, my God, the naivety. Yeah, I know. The naivety. Oh, my God. But listen, I can identify with that feeling. Yeah. So that's exactly how I felt when I was doing it. Yeah. So it all hassle, drama, chaos... Just I'm in, I'm in the moment, I'm 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 right now, and this this is me. I'm I'm mar I'm marrying this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm dating that now. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you think that you take this is kind of similar. This is if we use this as an analogy, actually, Christopher, to people who start personal development. Yeah. People think, oh, I'll do that. Um, top tips course, and shall sure, I be grant? Yeah. Yeah. Whereas people don't realise when you're doing personal development, it's 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 dark and it's deep and it's forever. There yeah. is fun in the middle of it all. It's not it's not scary all the time. Yeah, you know you can have fun doing personal development, especially if you're doing it in a community. Um, but yeah, it, it it's it's not you can't pop one pill and fix everything. No, it's a, that, and that's that's it. That's very, very unfortunate. You have to go extremely deep, and if you don't want to do the work, you're not going to reap the rewards. Exactly, exactly. So you didn't realize what come down was. <laughs> I had no idea. Right. What come so down what, was your, what was that like? I can remember then for the whole. Ho I can remember. Um, I rang my mother and father when I when I first took the E about two hours later, and I said, "You just won't believe it." Just took me force X C blah blah and the two of them were like, What is going? I actually told your parents on the phone. I told me parents, I swear to God, I told me parents and my dad 
I can remember he got on the phone. He said, look, at whatever you do, just make sure that you're careful. He says, you're not hurting anybody else and you're looking after yourself. Yeah. Too late at this point. You knew I already took it. <laughs> I'm already in. <laughs> the, the hoax is already in me, McDonald. <laughs> <laughs> he must have thought, that's him gone. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So well, what was your first experience like of coming down for me? Um, it was tough because I can remember I, I didn't stop instantly. I, it was like the, the addiction had started straight away. I didn't stop taking them. Yeah. I didn't stop taking them. And then I can remember one, the next morning, I was just like a zombie walking around by the pill, exhausted. I had danced the little legs on me, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I was just didn't want it to, to end. Yeah. But I wasn't getting that forced feeling that I had about eight hours ago. Yeah. And I was struggling, really struggling to understand like, how is this walk? Why isn't it walking again? Mm-hmm. Everything else. And then um, a friend of mine said to me, maybe you need to have a little sleep and then we'll go again in a while. So yeah. I've done just that. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I can remember um, all of the, uh, every fear and every anxiety in, in those moments just used to be magnified for me. Yeah. And the, the fidgety, the, the, the fidgetiness of, yeah. you know, yeah. and you actually can't get away from yourself. Yeah, and just as well, I can remember the cold sweats as well, you know what I mean? And then, like, the, the any anxiety that you have before is multiplied then. It magnifies like, in those moments. And then any little dark thoughts, uh, any little um, things that you have, have hidden away, as soon as you're on a come down, they just come, boom, tenfold. So anything that you, anybody who's listened to this, anything that you've buried, yeah, grows legs. Oh, big time. <laughs> and it can run much faster than you ever can. They are Olympians. <laughs> That's very true. Olympians. You're never beating them. No, never. Okay. So you're in Ibiza, you're living La Vida Loca, you're popping A's like you're having Weetabix. Yeah. And what happens next? Then um, it just went on and on, just trying to, I always kept trying to find like a, a happy medium where I could sort of sustain the, the feeling of the euphoria almost for the whole holiday. Um, and then I just realized that I couldn't, you know. Um, and I can remember then I was on so much of a downer for the past two, for the end of the two days that I just stayed in my room. And I just wanted the holiday to end. Yeah. I wanted to be home in my own bed. I wanted to go back with a normal life. I was done with the, the drug scene, everything yeah. else. And I just wanted to go back to the gym, getting the muscles again and everything else. Okay. And then what happened? Then I went home, got back into the gym, start feeling all right again, start taking ecstasy on the weekends. Okay, so then you were a weekend popper. Weekend popper. This went on for, uh, I'd say, every weekend I went out, I'd start taking ecstasy then. That was the the thing to do. And it was almost like the battle where you, the weekend would come, you forget how bad of a come down it was, how hard it was. And then I'd say, you know what, I'll do it again. And then, boom, just drop. Struggle to get through that week. Absolutely struggle. I have a kid, Christopher. Yeah. Nick, <laughs> yes. You forget how bad it was, and then you go know again. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Um, <laughs> oh, funny. And then, yeah, it was just it was just a roller coaster for about two, about a year and a half. It was like that. Um, and then another holiday came. And on the holiday, my friends introduced me to cocaine. Okay. And it's, it's cocaine then, that was instantaneous. Because right. with ecstasy, you're waiting about 30, 45 minutes for it to kick in. Sometimes I used to overthink and I'd be like, when is this going to kick in? Cocaine, it was instantaneous yeah. straight away. And I can remember the first time I took cocaine, I felt... I just felt great. It's the only way to explain it. I just felt great. I felt like I had arrived. I was the man. Yeah. 
I have, I'm born now. I'm about to get this, born. Yeah. Check me out in all my deadliness. This, I am the master of this universe. Yeah. Okay. And then, I can remember going downstairs then back to the pool with my friends and we we're doing backflips into the pool, jumping in, just completely horseplay. Um, and then for that whole week, then I was just strung out on taking cocaine. Okay. And I can remember it was just, I just, same thing as the ecstasy. I just could not stop taking it. Didn't want to stop taking it because I didn't want to stop feeling the feel good feelings. Yes. I was just constantly chasing them. Yes, yes. So you were all in. You weren't like messing. You were like all in in the addiction at this stage. Yeah, all in. All in. But did not have an idea. Because, see, it's very, very normal from where I grew up, the lads who I grew up with. This is a normal routine. Do you know what I mean? Yes, yes, yes. What part are you from, Ken Christopher? <laughs> Dublin A, um, a place called Fatima. Okay. Um, but it's just a normal routine. Do you know what I mean? I can remember... One day then, I was coming down off taking coke and one of the lads was coming in, feeding me with chocolate bars. He was like, you're all right, like, don't be worrying, you'll be grand, everything else. This is just another come down. Mm -hmm. And then I'd wake up in the morning, boom, go back again. My God. Okay. So when did this start turning dark for you? It started turning very dark with me when I would say I was about... 24. I've done this for, for a long time and I didn't realise then. So, lo and behold, when I went home, I stopped taking ecstasy, started turning to cocaine. And I got a lot of power from cocaine. And I realised very quickly that if I had a little bit of money and a little bit of cocaine on a night out, I felt much more important for myself. That makes sense? It makes total sense to me because when we have a lack of self-esteem yeah, yeah, and a lack of self-compassion and self-love um, and confidence, real confidence, yeah, you said power, power is ego. Yeah. Uh, and, and you know only too well about ego. But when we don't have self-respect and, and confidence, we will purchase it somewhere and snort it. Yeah. Or pop it into our mouths or stick yeah. it in our ass. Yeah. <laughs> We'll, we'll do anything, you know, yeah. literally anything to be able to feel that because we don't know how to, to, to feel ourselves correctly. Yeah. So what behaviours were you displaying when it did turn dark that you realised or that other people around you realised this is actually dysfunction now? So I, I was completely and utterly deluded. And I mean deluded beyond belief. Where I, I swear to God, I was convinced everybody else was the problem. And I, God. <laughs> I, I, I had a feeling that it's the whole world against me. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's not me. It's not me behavior. It's not me actions. It's not the people. It, it was just everybody else. Do you know what I mean? That's the addicted brain. Exactly. Um, and for, for long enough, this went on. And unfortunately... Then I, I, I couldn't get it from the steroids. I couldn't get it from the gym. Couldn't get it from the E. Couldn't get it from the Coke. So then I started to, to really try to get it from instant gratification, going out with girls. Do you know what I mean? If I couldn't love myself, they could love me. Yeah. And if, if they loved me, well, then I was enough. I was yes. going to be all right. And yes. if, if I got paranoid from the Coke or on a come down from a Coke, straight to the board, straight to the girls, and then that was the safety blanket. Yes, 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 absolutely. So you just said there, um, if I couldn't love me, they will love me. Yeah. So if if I say you are that, you are okay, Christopher, when they love you, you have value when they love you, exactly. you are enough when they love you. If I take them away, does that mean that you're not enough anymore and you don't have value? Exactly. Well, that's exactly how I felt. Yes. That's exactly how I felt. Yes. But at the time, I couldn't comprehend what was going on. Yeah. I did. It was like, it was like, did you ever see a series of unfortunate events? The, the movie? I didn't actually. 
Well, it's just this movie and lo and behold, unfortunate events keep happening and happening and happening. And I could never, never understand why do these key things keep happening to me? But it was me. It was <laughs> you didn't realise, Christopher, you were the common denominator here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hello, it's me. <laughs> so for, for long enough, I blame. You know what? Them. Isn't it so, is, aren't we so privileged that we can look back and laugh at that? It's great. I never thought I'd be able to be sitting here on the Nicola uh, Connolly podcast and be able to laugh at, laugh at this, don't you? It's brilliant. It's brilliant. It just it goes to show you how strong you are in your recovery, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I believe you have strong recovery. No, but, um, uh, so everybody else is the problem. You're the victim. Yeah. Uh, you're running around, doing it all, hanging around with the women. You're trying to fill your titanium plate up from every outside source yeah still not knowing that the only way to fix this pain and heal correctly is from the inside out yeah exactly so and where where do we where do we end up where things start to break down <coughs> excuse me so i had met i had met a really really nice girl and at that time then i had Everything I had me drink, me drugs, had me security with the relationship and everything else. And I can remember then that um, she got pregnant on my daughter, Lucy. And I said instantly, I said, brilliant. She's pregnant now. I'll have a kid and I'll settle down. That's me done. done. But as soon as she got pregnant, it was like my addiction just went on another level. Like another level, it would just intensify. It went from Friday and Saturday to Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And then she was struggling, obviously, because her partner was never around. Yeah. I was completely and utterly narcissistic beyond belief wow. as well. Um, and I, I can remember, I just, the, it was just like the perfect storm of everything just came together. Yes. And then, I was in this headspace of I'm just going to get as much out of this as I can until the baby comes because then I'm done. And consciously you were already thinking, A, I'm not responsible for myself. How am I going to be responsible for somebody else? Exactly. Yeah. So I'm going to milk this now until this is forced upon me nearly. But then in the middle of all that, then Christopher, you're destroying your relationship with your partner. Exactly. And I pushed that and pushed it and pushed it. Um, and it is unfortunate, do you know what I mean? But at the same time, when Lucy came along, I think she was only born for two days and I went straight back out, taking, oh. taking drugs and drinking and went to the hospital to see her and I had a blocked nose. And her mom at the time says, were you taking drugs? Mm. And I denied it down to the ground. Yeah. And that's when I started to lie about every single thing. Okay, okay. At this juncture, Christopher, what I want to do is for anybody who's listening to this, who has been raised by an addict, I just want to put in a big, huge, massive red flag for that person to know that an addiction in a mother or father is nothing to do with the child nothing to do with the child it's not like they were choosing drugs or alcohol or anything over you when addiction is in and the claws are in there is no amount of convincing or begging or crying or needing that person is not available that person is ill that person is sick that person is in addiction and can not do what it is that they need to do in a responsible manner. So I don't want anybody who's listening to this thinking, was I not enough? Yeah. And I'm sure that's difficult for you to hear, Christopher. Very, Nicola, that's resonated a lot. Yeah. yeah because and, you got real quiet and you're never quiet. No, no. You're contemplating there now. Um, so you just, you just marinate in that. It's really important. And I know the way that you're, I see your relationship with Lucy online and um, she, she will know when she's older and when she's able to have these conversations that it was nothing to do with her. 
nothing to do with her, all to do with you, your mm. insecurities, your pain, your hurt, your mm. inner child, all them things. So the lies begin. Yeah. So it just as soon as the, the lying started, it was just like I was convinced I was getting away with it. Mm. But I realized, see, the crazy thing is that like now where I am, certain situations will happen now. And I'll be like, oh, my God, that's how I used to behave back then. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And for so long, I was convinced I was getting away with all these crazy lawyers. Like, we, where were you last night? Oh, I was just sleeping on my friend's couch for the whole night. And I was out in parks, drinking, taking drugs. Um, it just got, it just escalated. The only thing I look around with is it escalated so quickly mm -hmm. to the only the only happiness I was getting in my life was from taking cocaine. Yeah. And well, the, can, I, can I just pause there? Yeah, yeah. It's really important for me that m anybody who's new, who doesn't know me, who's listening to this podcast, or for people who are familiar with my work, it's really, really important at this juncture to distinguish, distinguish the difference between happiness and pleasure. Yeah. Okay. So you thought that you were getting happiness. But yeah. you are actually getting pleasure. Yeah. There's a massive difference. Happiness can only ever happen from the inside out. It's an inside job. Pleasure can only ever come from the outside in. And when we mix up happiness for pleasure or pleasure for happiness, and you're chasing the happiness when you're actually chasing pleasure, again, they are Olympians. And yeah. they can come faster than you can. Absolutely, Nick. Right. So you, you're chasing the happiness. You think the only happiness that you're getting is through the drugs and the lying? And then, lo and behold, it just started to turn me into, well, I started to manifest in towards this person who was just, I was angry all the time. Yeah. I kept blaming the world, blaming my ex-partner, blaming the uh, Lucy at the time, blaming my mother and father. And... Do you know what? So at this point, you split up with Lucy's mom. Yeah, this is this is this and what, is what age was Lucy when this happened? Oh, um, she was young. She was only a couple of months old. Okay, so, so Lucy's mom had enough. She had enough, you know, and really so. Found her own self-respect. Yeah, she found um, her own self-respect and said, "This is not for me or my child." Yeah, I'm out of here. Hundred percent. That's ex and as soon as that happened, it was like I had this newfound freedom okay. didn't have didn't have to lie to anybody didn't have to make up any excuses i knew then that i could just do what i wanted to do without any um repercussions almost do you yes, know what I mean? yes. responsibility responsibility who, who's an addict who wants responsibility exactly no, none of them no 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 nobody and fair play to that girl yeah because you know what she did in that moment not only did she put prioritize herself and her child, she also did you your, the favor of your life. Yeah, the biggest Nicola. Even when I look back now, at the time I was like, "What is going on here?" The like, neck what? of you. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's your fault. Your fault. <laughs> um, but like, it's good to be able to look back now and see it through a clearer picture. But at the time, just constantly pointing fingers. Mm -hmm. Um. And then what happened was um, my grandfather had passed away. Okay. And then I got his house. I had been living on the floor for a while. But then it was just like, once again, it's like everything just works in addiction's favor. I had my own house. I didn't have to, to have Lucy um, that many times per week. And then COVID hit. Mm. And then I was just, I can remember I was just, Using, using, using. Can I just, can I interject yeah. for a second? See the way you said there, because, you know, I'm big into language. Um, I didn't have to have Lucy. Yeah. You didn't get to ha have Lucy. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's, it's a privilege. Yeah. No. Um, and it's very important um, for, for me when I see, it, it breaks me heart when any family breaks down. I'd be very, very sad about that. Mm. but when families do break down and you hear that language unfortunately from men more oftentimes 
where they're saying, oh, I have to do this and I have to do that. You don't have to do anything. You get to do it. Yeah, exactly. No. Yeah. So COVID hits, Christopher. And then I had the complete freedom of the, the house on my own. And then I wanted to keep my family down. They were at me and at me to try to stop drinking and using drugs. Because then at this time now, when I took cocaine, I was severely psychotic. Okay, I was. So what did that look like, Christopher? How did that present itself? Um, so when I was taking it, I was convinced my mother and father were in this grand um, conspiracy to get me assassinated, to get me shot. Um, and I'd go into this and then back over. But when I was back over, I was convinced that it's okay, it's just normal. It's just what cocaine does to people. But I did not realise that I was slipping into psychosis and coming back out. And this would intensify, intensify. And I got into a day programme. for. So before drinking. we get to the day programme... Um, what I've picked up from your story, just from watching it online, is that your sister is like your biggest advocate, cheerleader, saviour, warrior, phoenix, whatever you want to call her. Yeah. I just feel like she was like a woody woodpecker. Yeah. Caitlin, ha Caitlin me and Caitlin have a fantastic relationship, especially from a, a young age. Yeah. And I've already like, asked her to be my sister as well. <laughs> uh, she's great. She no. Get back to me. <laughs> <laughs> she's real, don't worry, Nicola. She's real. But she's always been a great help to me. But when all of this was going on, I used to text Caitlin and she only showed me one of the texts the other day. And I'd text her and I'd say, like, Am I safe? And she'd be like, Chris, well, of course you're safe. You're using cocaine again and you're yeah. going into psychosis. And I kept saying, are people coming to get me? This oh. this was a regular occurrence. Yeah. I'd be texting her. She'd see that I'm obviously using drugs again, and she'd be worried. Yeah. Um, so what's the age difference between you and her? Three years, exactly. We have the exact same date of birth. And she's younger than you, Christopher? She's three years younger than me. I'm 28, she's 25. Wow. Yeah. My God. Um, okay. But the thing is, like, even though she's younger than me, she... Because she's been so much, through so much with me and everything else, um, we're, we're cool growing up. She is so mature. and yeah, she's, 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 plugged, she's plugged in, I can see that. Yeah, she's got a fantastic head on her shoulders. Mm -hmm. And throughout all, it, all of this, I struggle to trust anybody. Mm -hmm. I mean anybody. But she's the only person who I could ever feel like I trusted. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I remember you telling a story about being in the UK. Yeah. Tell me about that. So this, the, obviously the using and everything kept intensifying. And it got to a stage then where I started off, one, I started off trying to get clean. And I would get like a, a little sprout of two week clean, back to relapsing, one week clean, back to relapsing. Just want the people to say he's actually trying, but I would use like without anybody knowing. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? I wanted the best of both worlds. Oh, I wanted yeah. people to think they're sober and to keep doing what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And I had been on a, a drink and cocaine binge for about three to four days. Mm -hmm. And I was upstairs in my room and I started to hear voices. And at this time, I went into the whole thing of people are coming to shoot me again, which is very, very common when you're on cocaine. I don't know why, but I would then take more and more cocaine. Wow. And then I just couldn't, I couldn't sit there in my room anymore. I was utterly and totally convinced someone was coming to shoot me there and then. So very I ran expensive habit, Christopher, if you're taking that much of it. Yeah. Very expensive. Extremely, I used to sell watches, PlayStations, you name it, in order to get money up. Yeah. Um, so we ran out of the house and didn't know where I was going. I can remember like little snippets. I was in a taxi, got a taxi out to, um, out to, I think it's 
our boy Fairhouse. Okay. Out by the beach, I'm not too sure. Um, and then just sitting there, I was drinking Jack Daniels, taking the last of cocaine, and I seen the boat. I seen the standing line across across from me, and I said, I need to get out of this country. And don't ask me how I done it. I got the taxi o- a taxi over to the standing line. I had the bank card with me. This is during the height of COVID. Oh my God, Christopher. <laughs> during the height of he COVID. He must have been in Dunleary then. Um, where or was the I? port maybe. I think the I... Port. I. That's exactly where I was. I was out know. where the cycle track, you know where the cycle track is? I don't know. I can't remember the name of it. But anyways, I can remember. Ended seeing, up on the boat. <laughs> I ended up I ended up going to the, the, the Dublin port and I talked my way onto the boat and I got the boat to Hollyhead and I was still drinking whiskey at this time. I don't know how they let me on it. I don't know how how they let me on the of boat. Of all places to land. I know. And I was going over and I was just causing so much mischief on the boat and I can remember somebody had said to me, do you want to sleep in one of these rooms? They must have been delighted to get me into one of those rooms. Uh, Absolutely. So I fell asleep, woke up in Hollyhead, and I didn't, I couldn't quite comprehend after being asleep and waking up what I was doing or where I was going or what was happening. Yeah. So I was in Hollyhead. It was 12 o'clock at night. I had no accommodation. I couldn't go. To, I couldn't. I was making my way down to London because I knew somebody in London who had yeah. lived where I lived, and that was just stuck in my head. He'll be able to help me. I'll claim a new identity. At this time, I'm still thinking I'm I'm being assassinated. My so God! I'm sitting in Hollyhead and I waited and waited till about mm-hmm. six o'clock in the morning for the the train to start again, mm-hmm. and I'm sitting there. And some young fella just walks in with a big bottle of wine in his pocket and he was locked. And I was like, who are you? And just start talking to each other, told him what was going on. He started um, giving me alcohol. We started using drugs together. Crazy. Somehow, I don't know how to this day, still don't know how, I took three trains from Hollywood, <laughs> from Wales, and I made me de- way down to London in Houston. And I had no money. I had no nothing. I was thrown off the train twice. Somehow convinced them to let me back on. Had no charger for my phone. And had nowhere to stay. Had nowhere to stay. My and God. I was absolutely freezing. I, I can scared. remember. I didn't really care. I was, I was, sort, of, I was sort of more in, into the how cold it was. That's all I can remember. I was just so cold. And I was just like, just get me to, to London. I'll be all right. It'll be warmer there. <laughs> exactly. exactly. So when I got there, I ended up managing to charge my phone. At this stage, my family are in an absolute panic. Yeah. They could see that I was in psychosis, but I couldn't see it. And then I was in London and my family had got me a hotel. Okay. And I couldn't stay in the hotel. I was coming down off the alcohol, off the drugs. And that's when I was in full-blown psychosis. I was okay. convinced there was something going on at home that I had done. And I was going to be killed for it. And that's the reason why I was in London. And that's why I was where I was. Right. And I couldn't stay in the hotel. So I can remember... I went to a park and I stayed in the bushes in the park and in between. So many other Irish men before you, Christopher. I know, I know. I was staying in the bushes in the park and there was like a, there was a place beside the park that you could use the internet, the Wi-Fi. I beg and played me family, me friends, just to send me some money on me card or do whatever they could do to get me money. And they'd only send like 10 or 15 euro because they didn't want me to buy drugs, obviously. Yes, yes. But I just buy alcohol. I just kept buying alcohol. And I was buying litres of uh, Captain Morgan's, just lying in the bushes, drinking Captain Morgan's. And this went on for two or three days. 
And were you eating at all, Christopher? No, I wasn't no. eating. No food, no. my God. At one stage, I tried to eat. I can remember my sister begged and pleaded me. She's on the phone to me. She says, please, just get fish and chips or something. Mm. And I tried to eat it, just kept getting sick. And there was one stage where I could feel my whole body was just trembling. I was scared. I was terrified. I was lying in the bushes. I was holding a bottle of Captain Morgan in my hand. And all I can remember thinking to myself is, this is my life now. I'm not going back to Ireland. I'm comfortable living on the streets. My God, you were actually choosing to be homeless. Yeah. And face the reality. And then my phone, I can remember there was like a little place across from the park where I'd go across, charge my phone, and I'd sit there shaking, cold. And I got contacted by this detective. It, this was bizarre. Still in full-blown psychosis. At this stage, I'm thinking, I'm being set up back home in um, Ireland. You're my still whole, in it. My whole family are, are, are on, in on this as well. Yeah, yeah. And this detective had texted me on WhatsApp. And he said, listen, Christopher, um, I'm blah, blah, blah. I'm from the missing persons case. And I'm thinking to myself, no detective would ever text you on WhatsApp. <laughs> so... so so this fella is in on it as well. He's 100%. And he's like, listen, any chance you can just let a member of the police in a station know that you're okay? Yeah. And I said, no way. No way. He was sending me his badge. He was sending me his ID. He was calling me. I was speaking to him. But at this stage, I didn't know. My family had contacted the, um, the police over there in London telling them that I'm in psychosis, yes. I don't know what's going on, I'm at uh, fear for my life, because I was constantly ringing my family and telling them, listen, I'm okay where I am, and when I'm not okay, I'm just going to take my own life. And oh, so you're contemplating suicide now now? Severely, because I was suicidal, it was just absolutely manic. Manic. And as this uh, detective is still texting me, I realised Caitlin was still texting me as well. So I'm telling Caitlin about what's going on. She said, look, just stay where you are. Everything will be okay. And I just realized, I said to myself, she is not back in Ireland. And I had video caller. She hung up, video caller. She hung up. And at this stage now, everything is clicking. This is not a detective. She's not in Ireland. These are tracking me phone. They're all coming to get me. And that's exactly what I was thinking as I'm lying in the bushes. So at this stage, I was just trying to go somewhere that nobody could know where I was at. Caitlin contacted me. She said, listen, I'm being honest with you. I'm in London and I'm with me dad. We took a day to get her. And all we want to know is that you're all right. Yeah. And I was absolutely petrified. And I was convinced. I'm conv I was convinced that this was what was going on. And my sister now was in on the whole thing. Yeah. I don't know how to this day, but I decided to meet Caitlin and I decided to meet me dad. Yeah. And as I seen them, they walked up to me. I walked up to them. A complete nowhere, a police van sticks on the sirens in the exact same moment, spins around the corner. And I said, oh my God, this is complete this is the truth. This is going on. And my dad just looked at me. He was expecting me to run. And only for the police uh, van took a left. We were on the right. I stayed there. Oh, yeah. and my Hayden, God, the timing of that was so bad. <laughs> it was It was crazy. It's, it's like something that you see in a film. Like Yeah, yeah. So Caitlin and my dad are trying to fill me in about what's going on. Caitlin hands me a cup of tea didn't drink the tea because I was convinced she was trying to poison me oh. um, they said look can we please get you to a hospital so they got me to a hospital um, it was in the hospital and the doctors are trying to tell me look you've took so much drugs and everything else you're in a little bit of a, 
uh, a battle with your own mind. They weren't saying anything at the moment. So I'm in the hospital and Caitlin and my dad said that they have to go home because my dad has um, di diabetes. He has to get his tablets and everything else. Mm. So as I'm in the mental health hospital, everything else, two policemen come in. Obviously, the detective had sent them to, to question me. So they were saying, listen, what is going on, blah, blah. And I just said, listen, I can't tell anybody what is going on. I said, but something fishy is going on. My sister and my dad had to come over and going back home. I said, I'm stuck in this hospital and now you are coming to see me. I said, if they were really worried about me, do you not think they would have stayed here? And the two guard or the two policemen turned down and says, that is a bit fishy. <laughs> I, said, I was just, I was just gone. That's the end of part one. Come back next week for part two. I hope you really enjoyed that podcast because I know I really enjoyed recording it. I'll continue to bring people to you that I know for sure will inspire you towards change. If you want to start your own personal development journey or go deeper with that, make sure to check out my website, nicolaconnellyburn.com, for my courses, workshops, and online groups. And remember, an empty sack won't stand. You cannot give away what you don't own. So make sure that your cup is full and then overflows. Because what's in the cup is for you and what's on the saucer is for everyone else. Take it easy and I'll catch you on the next episode of Soul Chats. Real chats for real people, with real soul. Slav.